morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from the USA, Professor Gabriel Zada. Professor Zada is a board certified neurosurgeon and internationally recognized expert in brain, skull base, and pituitary tumor surgery, as well as a variety of endoscopic and minimally invasive neurosurgical techniques. Dr. Zada has treated over 2,000 patients with brain and skull based tumors using both minimally invasive and open cranial approaches. As the director of the USC Endoscopic Skull Based Surgery Program, Dr. Zada directs a comprehensive minimally invasive cranial surgery program including endoscopic skull based pituitary surgery, exoscopic minimally invasive parafascicular surgery, and intraventricular neuroendoscopy. He also co directs the USC Radio Surgery Center and performs both gamma knife and true beam radio surgery. He has a keen and clinical academic interest in brain and skull based tumors and has published over 150 peer reviewed articles on various topics mostly relating to brain, pituitary tumors and skull base surgery. He has co-authored and edited the textbook titled The Atlas of Cellar and Paracellar Lesions which has been downloaded over 140,000 times. He is an NIH funded principal investigator whose research laboratory at the Zilka Neurogenetic Institute focuses on the genomics and epigenetics of the brain and pituitary tumors. Dr. Zada serves on the editorial board of the JNS. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars and today he will be talking about update on the management of pituitary adenomas. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest also from the USA, Dr. Abdullah Khalesh. Dr. Khalesh is who originally is from Turkey, currently is a scientist and in charge of the famous Vaskaya lab at the Department of Neurological Surgery, University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, Madison, USA. His clinical interests are focused upon global neurosurgery, neuroanatomy, white matter dissection, microneurosurgical anatomy and approaches, neurogenetics, neurogenesis and neural stem cell, medical cinematography, 3D visualization systems and 3D sculpture optics. He is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences and he is also the author of several peer reviewed publications and book chapters. We are extremely honored to have him at your webinars today and today he will be talking about safe, affordable and sustainable microsurgical techniques in the low and middle income countries, the Baskaya lab experience. The chair for the first session of today is of distinguished faculty from Japan, Professor Tadashi Watanabe. Professor Watanabe is the professor of neurosurgery at the Aichi Medical University, Aichi Japan. His clinical interests are focused upon endoscopic cranial based surgery and is an expert from Asia for the management of pituitary tumors and other skull based pathologies. He is an integral part of the ACNS delegation organizing conferences and workshops all over the world and is also a noted author with several publications in various peer reviewed journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Zada. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Dr. Ken Matsushima. He was a previous fellow in the microsurgical neuroanatomy under Professor Albert L. Rotten's mentorship in the USA, focusing on the skull base which includes jugular foramen, venous system, temporal bone and brainstem. He also studied particularly brainstem surgery under Professor Bertel and Fay in Germany. He is currently working as a stem professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Tokyo Medical University under Professor Michiro Kono in Japan. His research has been widely published including two front covers of the JNS and has received several national and international awards such as the YNS award from the WFNS and the Raymondi award from the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Dr. Kellis. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Tadashi Watanabe. Yes, thank you Dr. Raja and good morning and good evening everybody and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to chair uh, Professor Zada. Actually, I am also very interested in uh, minimum invasive neurosurgery and including endonasal surgery and uh, endoscopic keyhole surgery. And also I have started using exoscope since 2019. And uh, nowadays I am using uh, both exo and endoscope. So uh, actually, maybe uh, the interest is uh, really same as uh, Professor Zada. 
And uh, I have seen many papers and um, many books uh, Professor Zado have written, and I was really surprised. And also uh, surprised again uh, uh, about your uh, age. You are so young, and and also you have done a really big uh, job, big work already. So uh, today, I'm really looking forward to uh, have your lecture today. So um, please start your lecture. Professor Zaza. Thank you, Professor Wadnambi, for the introduction, and Dr. Raja, and uh, it was a great introduction. And we have very similar interests in our practice, so I hope we can sit down sometime and uh, talk over coffee or lunch or something. But uh, thank you for having me today to the uh, ACNS. Um, so uh, I wish I could talk about other things like port surgery or exoscopic surgery, but today I'll just focus on just some of the things we're doing uh, for pituitary adenoma surgery and overall management um, uh, that are uh, that may be of interest. Um, and so, uh, as everybody here knows, the goals of surgery when looking at patients with pituitary tumors, uh, we look at a lot of different uh, axes and a lot of different categories. And I think that's one reason I love these operations. Um, vision, obviously, very critical. Endocrine function which can be hypopituitarism or hormone over-secretion, uh, mostly in the case of Cushing's disease or acromegaly. Uh, we always want to achieve maximal safe tumor resection when possible, gross total tumor resection. And sometimes it's okay to think about uh, being safe and leaving a small target for radio surgery uh, if needed. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And as we move forward, we, our job is increasingly to get tissue because it's inevitable we will find drugs or immunotherapies that will be able to treat pituitary tumors one day, hopefully soon. And we really need this for large, non-functional invasive tumors. Uh, you know, a tumor like this that's wrapped around all the arteries of the circle willis, wrapped around the optic nerves, even the best surgery is going to leave a little bit of tumor most likely behind, et cetera. And we're going to need some other therapies. So surgery is the uh, mainstay of treatment for, for uh, primary treatment for non-functional tumors, acromegaly and Cushing's disease. There's ample evidence, even level one evidence for this. It can be curative, but obviously tumor invasion is the problem. And that's where um, we need other uh, treatments. And it's just really nice to compare how far the uh, field has evolved in half a century and I always like starting with this video from Professor Guillaume that was shared to me by uh, Paolo Capabianca in Italy. This is the first known use of the endoscope that I've seen. Um, this was used with the nasal speculum by Professor Guillaume in 1962. And in 2023, our optics, instruments, uh, uh, visualization, and techniques uh, have really advanced. And so it's fun to even be a very, very small part of, of this journey. Uh, safety should be the number one priority when treating pituitary patients. These are benign tumors. They're almost always elective operations, unless it's a case of apoplexy. And, uh, you know, there's a, th there should be very low rates overall when taking a team approach of stroke, carotid artery injury, cranial nerve injury, and hopefully even things like CSF leak and hypopituitarism. So uh, there's a lot of published papers on outcomes. We, um, we use a, a checklist approach, simulation, anything we can to make this operation safer and get patients uh, in and out of the hospital with good outcomes. We, we try to be very transparent with our outcomes. This is what I learned from Marty Weiss, who was my mentor, uh, who uh, had, had done um, nearly 5,000 pituitary operations when he retired. And um, these are for direct cases, so mostly for pituitary tumors. Um, you should you see the rates of these major complications should be very uh, low. What we've seen in the last 10 years with the extended cases is that these rates have gone up. And that's understandable because we're taking on more complex pathology. We're being more aggressive. But for basic pituitary surgery, we need to maintain safety. And even direct approaches... Um, I, uh, one thing I learned from Ed Laws, where I did, I did my fellowship with Professor Laws and also from Marty Weiss, is that neurosurgeons can do their own approaches. And I'd love to hear what, what Dr. Watanabe and everyone else does. Uh, if you use an ENT surgeon or you do your own approach, 
Um, I, I, I do my own approaches for direct cases um, and even some uh, extended cases. And uh, I have a great relationship with our ENT doctors. We work as a team, but for basic pituitary surgery, I can do these approaches in 15 minutes. And I don't think we need ENT surgeons for all of these operations. I think we will, in at least in the United States, I think we will see a paradigm shift back to neurosurgeons doing direct approaches, which if you think about something like an ACDF, we don't need an ENT to get us access to the spine and go through the neck. Why, why do we necessarily need an ENT to get us access to the cella? I think that uh, the, the, the curve will swing back in favor of neurosurgeons doing most of their approaches. And I know it might be differently uh, globally. Uh, our, our median case time is about an hour and 40 minutes. Actually, it's, it's less than that even now. Uh, a lot of our pituitary operations take about one hour if there's no CSF leak to repair or even less. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, just some of our outcomes here, hormonal remission in about 82% of functional tumors. Um, and we get very advanced cases where I work, um, a lot of, a lot of large invasive, uh, tumors. Um, so just some basics, as I mentioned, I do the approach myself. Uh, um, we like to expose the whole cella. And then, um, the first thing we always do is we assess the consistency of the tumor and whether it's a hard tumor, soft tumor, I think this is going to become more and more important, and we're publishing more outcomes now that the tumor consistency plays a major role, not just in the outcome, but in how the tumor should be removed. I, I believe that a soft tumor is removed differently than a firm tumor. And when people talk about an extracapsular approach, that's usually for a firm adenoma. A soft tumor can be should should be suctioned. And as we are now exploring surgery of the cavernous sinus again, this is even more important. The tumor consistency is very, very important when you're working in the cavernous sinus. And I'll talk about that a little more. So a little bit about Cushing's disease. Um, this is, of course, Professor Oldfield, who left us um, almost 10 years ago now. And he did a lot of exploration about um, MRI negative Cushing's and inferior petrosal and cavernous sinus uh, sampling. And uh, one thing we've learned is that the preoperative di diagnostics have to be accurate to get good outcomes. I think sometimes surgeons fall into the trap of operating on pseudo Cushing's disease or other entities because the preoperative workup may not be stringent enough. So you have to work with your endocrinologist to make sure you do the appropriate testing for Cushing's, especially in cases that are MRI negative. And a good example of that is that IPSS should only be done if they already have evidence of high cortisol levels or high 24-hour cortisol levels. IPSS is not a diagnostic test for Cushing's syndrome by itself. And I think um, variations like that should be understood by neurosurgeons who are doing these cases. When we have negative MRI, um, we have been exploring the use of 7T MRI for uh, otherwise negative uh, Cushing's cases. We've had about 50% of cases where we can see a small adenoma on 7T imaging that you cannot see on 1.5 or 3T imaging. And these have correlated with the laterality on petrosal sinus sampling as well. So we'll see moving forward. What we're doing now is we're changing some of the sequences to make them more sensitive uh, to look at the cella because of um, with 7T, you get a little bit of artifact sometimes that you don't get with 1.5 or 3T. We try to uh, follow extracapsular uh, resection whenever possible. We expose the whole cella, even though the tumor may be slightly lateral. This tumor was a very uh, small adenoma on the left side. I do not routinely resect the cavernous sinus wall, but if there is evidence of invasion, I, I have no, we've been resecting it for many years. What we're trying to do is find the plane between the normal gland and, and tumor and now get under, under the adenoma here and try to define its edges and keep it as intact as possible. And then the tumor can be delivered, hopefully whole, and then doing a little cleanup at the end. And we see these patients' uh, rates of 
cortisol drop rapidly when we do an extra uh, capsular uh, resection. Here's another example. This was an MRI negative Cushing's case. I'm going to zip through some of the details. We actually just published this one in uh, JNS Focus. Uh, there was clear evidence of, of Cushing's. 3T and 7T MRI were negative. Um, IPSS was performed and showed a right-sided adenoma. And this it shows that it's uh, very hard to see the tumor there. This is the IPSS. And this is our setup. We've exposed the right cavernous sinus in this case as well. We start with our cellar uh, dural incision and controlling the venous bleeding. And then we use a nerve hook and arachnoid knife to do our dissections. There's the arachnoid knife opening up into the cavernous sinus. Uh, so we knew, we, we had a suspicion this tumor would be straddling the wall of the medial cavernous sinus. And that's exactly where we found it ultimately. And there it is right there. Now we're cutting the medial wall of the cavernous sinus to achieve a resection. Now you're really seeing the tumor. Very small adenoma, probably a couple millimeters right in the wall. And that's why it's not seen on MRI. And we're able to resect it. And this patient had a uh, rapid drop off of, of cortisol and is in remission. So the next day they came down to 2.6 and they were symptomatic. They were started on hydrocortisone. So when doing a uh, pituitary surgery, you saw the gland was preserved there. Um, a, a good tip to surgeons is to always find the gland on preoperative imaging if possible. Look for the enhancement, see what side it's on so that you can protect it during surgery. This is very uh, critical. Um, acromegaly, another condition we treat a lot of, we get a lot in our patient population. Um, at the time we consulted for this man from Anatolia who was uh, at the time, he was the tallest man in the world with gigantism. But um, it's important to remember that with acromegaly, there are changes in the sinonasal cavity, the sphenoid sinus, the carotid arteries, the bone, and that the approach is very important in acromegaly as well. You have to keep an eye out for the carotid, as sometimes you'll see the carotid has a very large caliber. It can, it can be tortuous and have some ectasia. And sometimes we see the carotid right in the cella. So you always have to Doppler no matter what. On any single case, we use a Doppler to make a safe uh, opening. Another interesting thing about acromegaly and growth hormone tumors, and when you compare them with non-functioning tumors, is that their, their direction of growth and patterns of growth are much different. And we think that this is somehow related to the biological level of the tumor, even on the cellular level. The acromegaly tumors like to grow into bone and they like to grow inferiorly into the sphenoid sinus and clivus. We see this in a huge disproportionate amount. As you know, non-functioning tumors like to grow superiorly through the aperture of the diaphragma cella into the, superior, uh, uh, into the supracellar cistern. So it's very common to have snowman or dumbbell shaped non-functioning tumors, whereas growth hormone tumors, you, you almost never see this pattern. It's much more common to have other patterns. So we think that this may explain some of the biology of these tumors, uh, that maybe there's a clue there for treating them as well. Here's a patient with acromegaly, IGF-1, 597, operative time, 50 minutes, um, less than one hour. I just like to show how we do some of the approach on our own for some of the surgeons who may be interested. So what we do is we, uh, we move the inferior turbinate over, inject the septum, move the middle turbine over to identify the os. We make an incision in case we need a flap for a pedicled nasal septal flap. We always maintain that flap below and we preserve olfactory epithelium up high. We, we actually do not resect any tissue on our approaches. We don't use a tissue debreeder and we do a tissue sparing approach. So we try to preserve olfaction and we try to preserve the flap on every single case. Here's the vomer being exposed. And then we remove the vomer, no drilling, just a kerosene. And we do a lot of this part without a drill. It's much, much faster 
We use a drill if it's an extended case, like a tuberculum or planum case or clivus case. We do wide bony removal. And I usually do an X-shaped incision after we Doppler and then assess the consistency of the tumor. Is it soft? Is it hard? Remove what we can. And this is a pretty straightforward case, of course. At the end, we'll use an angled endoscope if needed to inspect the boundaries. But this was, a, as I mentioned, very straightforward case, always a Valsalva maneuver at the end. And then in this case, just an easy gel foam reconstruction. And then we use Surgicel to hold everything in place, occasionally a bio, bio glue. Should be very straightforward. What about a case like this where the tumor is firm and it's growing straight up and compressing the optic nerve? Well, you could do an extended on this if you need to. Uh, this was done a couple of years ago. We did this with a 30 degree endoscope looking up just to confirm we decompressed the optic nerve. And there was a big CSF leak here, bigger than usual, I think because the term, the tumor had a little more fibrosity there, but um, needed a fat graft, patient did, did great. But this shows the use of angled endoscopy can, can be very favorable. This is what I was talking about earlier, very firm tumor, not suckable, not curettable. So we call this a, a grade four, almost calcified tumor. And this one has to be resected with an extra capsular approach. You could use something like a CUSA or Sonapet, but it, it doesn't help that much. So on a firm tumor, extra capsular approach is what we use when we've shown how consistency is very important and can it also affect extent of resection. We've published several papers on that. Here's another firm adenoma. You can see that no way this is suctioning out. It's a almost like rubber. And here's the normal gland. And so you have to use a cotinoid or other things to protect the gland and arachnoid. And again, this one had a leak, but able to reconstruct it. And uh, this one should be removed with an extra capsular technique. One more example, softer tumor, but also an extra capsular dissection. You can see if it's more firm and will stay together, this is a good way to resect the tumor. And here's arachnoid and diaphragma. Let me skip through this one. So even large giant adenomas, we see a lot of these do not require an extended approach. Uh, so I, I very seldom use extended approaches, even something like this. So the important things to look at are this waste of the diaphragma cella. This is what most people look at. There's a couple other measurements available, but if this area is large enough, you can usually get the tumor to descend down, especially if it's soft. If it's firm, then you have to be ready to do more of an extended or extra capsular approach, but you have a Valsalva maneuver, you have a 30 degree endoscope, and ultimately you want to see the arachnoid descend into the cella symmetrically. And that will tell you that you have decompressed this supracellar cistern. It's usually enough uh, for big tumors with a large waist like this. The question is after you remove it with thin arachnoid that's descending into the cella, should you do a fat graft or a gel foam or other reconstruction to prevent a CSF leak? And this is a case-by-case -case decision. If it's a high BMI patient, thin arachnoid will often go right to a fat graft. Uh, if it looks like there's some, uh, you know, uh, some, some of those odds in your favor, we might just do a gel foam reconstruction. Here's a different tumor though. This one uh, is a supercellar extension, but also extending into the anterior cranial fossa over the tuberculum, over the planum, an extension into the oculomotor cistern. This patient actually had not just bitemporal hemianopsia, but a right third nerve palsy as well, oculomotor nerve palsy. So this is a, a good case for an extended approach. I would not try to do this without removing the tuberculum cella, at least the bone, and most likely opening the dura as well. So let's look at this. Uh, the first thing I do still is to check, open the cella, and I want to see if it's a soft tumor or a hard tumor and grade the consistency. We've already removed the bone of the tuberculum here, but just to, to check what it's like, we do a midline opening of the supracellar uh, dura, 
And then even though this is a pituitary tumor, look how dense it's adherent to the optic chiasm. Normally there's a very nice plane, but sometimes these are really stuck, even though there's a pseudo capsule and not even a real capsule. Here's the ACAs, thinned out chiasm. And you have to be very careful here not to worsen vision. Even if you leave a, a small, small residual, sometimes it can be better than trying to manipulate the chiasm or, or strip its vascularity. So you have to be very careful in these cases. In this case, we were able to get a complete removal, gland preserved, and vision improved, third nerve palsy improved. And you saw the reconstruction with a the flap there. What about this case? Well, I would love to hear some other opinions. Um, I, you know, I, I would value Dr. Uh, Professor Watanabe's opinion on something like this as well. This, the radiology report said this was a craniopharyngioma, but when we looked at the patient very closely, the IGF-1 was elevated. So this was an acromegaly case. I'd love to hear, you know, uh, what other people would do with this. So for this case, I actually started with a craniotomy. Because of the lateral extension, the uh, this past the sylvian fissure here, spilling into the anterior cranial fossa, the MCA looks involved here, and then there's a large cystic component going into the lateral ventricle. So this is something we started with a terional craniotomy because I wanted to have the most control of this region um, uh, for, uh, and view of this region. Oh, sorry. And uh, we did that from above here. And you could see what was left, cavernous sinus and cella. Now I feel much safer going from below. And everyone has heard of this phenomenon. If you do not remove the supracellar component um, and from the endonasal approach, you can have bleeding or, or what they call post-operative apoplexy. And that's a real phenomenon. I've had that happen a couple of times where I have to do a craniotomy immediately after an endonasal case because their vision gets worse from a bleeding residual. So in this case, we did the craniotomy first, then we go back endonasally and remove the cellar part. I did not feel I could remove the whole cavernous sinus part in this case. This was about several years ago. And here's the normal gland, but she had gamma knife and medications and her tumor shrunk down and she's doing great um, in complete remission. So for acromegaly, you have really good backup options with medications. For Cushing's disease, you also have some. For non-functional tumors, we do not have medications. It's very important to, uh, to what, what you decide to do when you're there is more important than when you, whether you do this endoscopically or microscopically. We have to make good decisions as, as surgeons. Um, Surgery is, is not the answer moving forward. It's the first step for a lot of patients, but um, we need more medications, more immunotherapies. Um, some of my colleagues, especially Ian Dunn and Linda B, have looked at um, anti PD1 and PDL1 uh, medications for various tumors. Um, Temozolomide seems to be very limited. People are trying some other agents here, but there's no good treatments for non functional tumors, as you know. It's where we need a lot of work. We have some good options for growth hormone adenomas, and there's a lot of options now for Cushing's disease with mixed results. We are also exploring the epigenome. This is something we have um, funding uh, to study. Uh, we, uh, we're, we are creating a classifier, and there's some other ones out there, but we think the epigenome plays a major role, especially DNA methylation and the development of these tumors. So we have a nice uh, group uh, consortium that we work with to collect samples and do some of the genetic analysis. And we hope this will result in some new drug targets and drugs. So I'm going to um, slow down there just in the interest of time. Uh, I'm I would, would, would love to have a discussion if we have a few minutes um, and, and talk about some of these points. Um, but uh, as I tried to cover the endoscope is obviously very um, powerful, but it's only one tool. Um, we should try to achieve high degrees of safety and effectiveness, and we really need new targeted approaches. Uh, so with that, thank you to the Asian Congress for uh, having me today, and I'm happy to have a, a, a conversation about some of these cases or techniques. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zada, for a wonderful 
fabulous lecture. And uh, well, first of all, I was surprised uh, about the quick surgery. Your surgery finished within one hour, doesn't it? For some of the fast ones, yes. The approach takes 15 minutes, resection yeah. takes 15, 20 minutes, and closure takes five minutes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, for uh, in our institute, maybe the first one of our ENT guys is doing an approach meticulously with the cutting and mucosa. And uh, after one hour, I do my job. And the uh, last part of 30 minutes, they do a closure. So I was surprised. Within one hour, you are doing a very quick. Yeah, we do, we do a lot of these. And we, can, we unfortunately can't do them all with ENT. Our ENTs are too busy. And my schedule, very busy. And, to, and so we, we learn to do the approach by ourselves with ENT guidance and now by ourselves. And we have great outcomes. So now you do by yourself all the surgery? Uh, I do I mean, all the direct uh, direct approaches uh, if it's not an ex extended approach by myself. If it's a if I need a flap or it's an extended approach or we need ethmoidal maxillary exposure of course with ENT. But they they don't mind at all because uh, uh they don't have the time to cover all my cases. I have too many cases for them and it's much faster to a direct approach is very fast and safe. Yeah. Yeah. Really impressive, thank you. And uh, and uh, is there any question from audience? No. So far, none. Can I? Can, can I, uh, Doctor Watanabe? Can I ask you what you would do with yes. one of the these cases? Uh, the huge one. Yeah, the huge one. I would love. I'll bring uh, it up. Just, yes. I'm just in interested in what your thoughts are on okay. a case like this one. Yes, yes. We do. Uh, we choose a combined approach uh, uh -huh. for this kind of uh, uh, tumor, so, which is extending superolaterally beyond the IC. I uh, always choose a combined approach. So uh, basically, we use a, a eyebrow keyhole approach. Uh huh. And, uh, uh super orbital approach team just support the uh re resection with tumor the uh you know the main surgeon is the endonasal team and the uh, uh, super orbital team support like uh, uh pushing medially or mm -hmm. uh, uh, remove some part of the tumor which is extending anterior or lateral but basically, the main resection of the tumor is done by endonasal team. And, uh, uh, you know, cooperation is really important. And uh, uh, regarding the uh, repair of the floor, uh, cellar floor, uh, the material can be uh, uh, delivered from, from, uh, uh, from above. And it, it is easy to overlap the uh the inlay graft from inside and uh, you know the uh super orbital team can uh, fix the material and and then uh, they can fill the csf uh when finished the surgery <coughs> so there is several uh, advantage uh, when we do a combined approach and uh and we don't use a microscope. We use endoscope mm -hmm. or exoscope for, uh, for both. So. Yeah, that's great. That's very nice. I, I yeah. love eyebrow approaches, superorbital. It's one of my favorite, but I don't do a lot of combined surgery still. Mm -hmm. We've done a few, but not a lot. Uh, we, 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 we stage them sometimes, but I, uh, I, I, don't, I, I think it's a great way to go also. Yes, it's a kind of team surgery, so... We need a team. Uh, the you know we need a reliable two team. Yeah. Always, <laughs> absolutely. Only one by one team. So, yes. yes. Thank you. That's that's great. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I saw uh, some artificial hard material when you repair the floor. So, wh what do you use for uh, uh, repair when you use a hard material? Uh, 
Yeah, you, uh, that was an older case. Thank you for pointing that out. I have tried many things in mm -hmm. in the last uh, you know couple decades. Uh, yes. However, uh, I at at one point I was using a Medpour plate. Um, uh, Medpour, which is a uh, like a peg, poly, yeah, absorb uh, over a lot of time polyethylene, I believe, glu uh, glycose, glu glucose uh, uh, plate. Um, and that's now made by Stryker or sold by Stryker. And I was using it in a gasket seal um, yes. uh, type of uh, a reconstruction with either fasciolata or durgin. And I have stopped doing that. I, I no longer use a rigid buttress for most of my cases. Even my larger reconstructions, nothing synthetic. Um, I'll either use fat and then sometimes a durgin and then a flap and that's it. And no more, no, I actually don't do gasket seals very much anymore. And I don't do rigid reconstruction anymore. And I've not had any problems. Actually, my CSF leaks have gone way down just using fat, durgin and, uh, and uh, flap. Occasionally lumbar drainage, very low rate, five cc's an hour. If it's a, 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 a you know a higher flow leak or something more concerning, but um, uh, I think some of it is a learning curve. To be honest, that my my CSF leaks have gone down in in my second half of my series. Most of us will see that, but uh, but I also think no more synthetic, no more foreign materials um, unless it's Duragen, and, okay. uh, and and no more rigid uh buttress okay i i sometimes use uh the bony septum uh -huh. actually i i prefer a transceptor approach and mm -hmm. uh, uh uh every time we have the bony plate every time uh, uh by bony septum <laughs> so when we need, we use the bony septum as a cellar reconstruction, but but otherwise we replace it again uh, between the mucosa. But uh, uh, as you said, you preserve everything. <laughs> uh, you said, uh, yeah. The uh, only tissue that we remove is yeah. uh, a little bit of the. We do not remove the turbinates, the middle yeah. turbinates. Yeah. We do not use a debreeder. You saw I just separate the tissues and push them out of the way. The, the only place I take tissue is uh, is the um, like the 10 o'clock corner, top patient's top right corner where the endoscope goes. We remove the superior turbinate and some of that ledge and tissue. And we use a true cut instrument to do that, but no, no debreeder. How about the bony septum? I saw the mucosa was cut both sides, and uh, there may be some bony structure between them. We remove so, the bony septum, yes, completely. Bony septum, you remove, yeah. okay. We I remove, see. yes, fully, yes. The vomer yeah. and bony septum, we remove fully, yes. Okay. I see. Mm, interesting. I'd love to show you sometime on uh, if if we have the opportunity and learn from you as uh, how you do it. Yeah, I also like to meet you di uh, ne, directly. <laughs> okay. We will. So, okay, so uh, do you have some, take some questions, questions from yes, our panelists please. as well? Yes, my uh, co-host Liu Bun Seng is here as well. Any questions from you, Liu? Yeah, thanks, uh, Raja. Thanks, Professor Zada, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I, I would like to ask from you, how you determine the size of the fat graph that you want to use. Is there any way for you to measure before you choose the piece that you want to put inside? And then uh, whether it's necessary to choose a flat graph, a flat, flat, flat graph that, that people say you take when you harvest the facial lata, or you can actually take any of the periumbilical fat. Uh, do they actually make the difference? And when actually you will use a facial lata or you never use facial lata anymore? My last question is that, is there any strategy to achieve zero percent of CSF leakage, Professor? Thank you. Those are great questions. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, so the first one is to measure. How do you measure the fat graft? I don't measure. We um, we we don't do one big piece. We usually do a couple a couple medium sized pieces. That's one strategy um, that I've learned. And uh, the you know it's it. There's a lot of judgment uh, for those of us who have done it. I have underpacked. I have overpacked, which uh, before and learned from that mistake. Also, 
You want uh, obliteration of dead space, number one, gentle propping of the arachnoid, gentle. Um, if you're using gel foam instead of fat, you have to be careful because gel foam swells. And so in the cavernous sinus, I've seen patients that wake up normally, but over the next 24 hours, swelling, I think, develops a, a, a cranial nerve palsy that's temporary. For fat, uh, that's, how, that's how we do it. I do not do any measurements, but um, we have gone back and forth between abdominal and thigh over the years. And my uh, Marty Weiss, my mentor, used to always say he loves the fascia from the abdomen more than the fascia lata from the thigh. He likes the rectus fascia. It's softer. It's not as thick. It looks more like dura. I have basically stopped taking any fascia at this point. I would use duragen mostly instead of fascia. Um, it, uh, so mostly we're harvesting fat and I do it from the belly now. I, uh, I take a small, you know, as much as we need from the belly, usually no fascia needed. Um, uh, but I think there is a difference in the fascia for sure. The fat a little bit less so between the site of harvest. Um, was there a third? I couldn't remember if there was a third uh, uh, question. So I think any, there was. Any, any method to achieve zero CSF application? Uh, you know, I think it's, we should aim for 0%. It's not, the reason I think it's not possible is because in, we, in one of our papers we published, half of our leaks were not detected during surgery. So what does that mean? It means either um, we missed the leak or they woke up and had emesis or something contributed to development of a leak. Um, you know, uh, another example actually is very thin arachnoid. Um, if it, uh, you have to be careful what you put in there and, and you always want a separation between your flap and the arachnoid. And this is a good teaching point. I never put the flap right on the arachnoid. And the reason for that is I think it can cause an infection. The arachnoid is very thin and sometimes the flap is not very clean. It, it, uh, you know, we always irrigate it, but still it's coming from the nasal cavity. It's in the nasal cavity for a lot of your resection. And I've made the mistake of putting the flap right on the arachnoid without a buttress. And I, I've had a meningitis that way. And I think it was related to that, that bacteria can eat right through the arachnoid. It's very thin. So we always do something now, gel foam or fat to create a, a barrier there. That It seems obvious, but these are small tips. Um, uh, and then also, I think somehow to get a 0% leak rate, we have to focus on the cases that do not have intraoperative leaking uh, um, to prevent leakage, like the one I showed where the arachnoid is coming way down, no leak intraoperatively, but still high risk for leak if you don't do anything. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's judgment otherwise with when to use a flap, um, when to use a lumbar drain. We're down to probably like most people, 2%, 1-2% on the directs, on the extendeds, maybe up to 5% still okay, uh, on, on our bigger series, but definitely lower. Um, so those are the tips I have. I think we, we're getting there. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zada, for sharing these wonderful tips. Uh, what you asked regarding the 0% leaks, I think in Japan, the leak rate is very, very low, isn't it, Professor Watanabe? I think the reason that uh, they might be, they are experts in suturing. They use the endoscopic uh, suturing, and uh, maybe that's why the leaks are low. I saw Professor uh, Watanabe it's a special instrument to the node pusher and the node processor. Would you like to uh, enlighten us regarding your technique of closure, Professor Watanabe? Well, uh, uh, so far, uh, uh, the best way to close the pituitary adenoma surgery, uh, it, I, I think, uh, put the fat inside the uh tumor cavity or if there is no leak we can use a dredge in, uh, as an inlay and then i i do a one only one suture uh i always uh, i prefer uh, uh inverted t or inverted y uh, dural cutting and the three point suture uh, in one uh, knot and uh it it worked very well and uh it will fix the fat stably and uh, even if 
the intracranial pressure uh, raising up, uh, it will uh, keep keep the uh, the fat uh, stably. So uh, we prefer suturing. Actually, Asian guys, including <laughs> Japanese guys and uh, Korean guys, like to do a suturing. I don't know. Yes, why. I've seen that. It's amazing. <laughs> I have. I, I'm in awe of uh, the people who have developed those techniques. Yes, there are special notes been uh, which have been published. The Osaka note by Professor uh, Takio Goto and team, and also I have seen that same note pushers and all done by Professor Watanabe as well. Uh, one question across uh, to Professor Zada is uh, you told us that uh, the, the technique is different when it is a soft and when it is a hard tumor. Like uh, how different is it? Is it like the approach from beginning or are you no, just, the tumor? just the resection part. Uh, but, but your point is well made actually, because I think one day, especially for meningioma surgery, less for pituitary, uh, when we predict with MRI or something else, if it's going to be a hard or soft tumor, it will change our approach. I think it will maybe not fully, but we can contour our approach minimally invasive versus maximally invasive. If a tumor is very firm, you often need a larger approach and more of an on block style resection. Um, I, I think that imaging predictability will change, but no, it's the technique of tumor resection. That's the biggest difference. The soft tumors, if, if you try a extra capsule approach, they, they melt, they fall apart. It, it's not rational. So we use either a two suction approach or suction and curette. It becomes most important in the cavernous sinus. When you're removing a cavernous sinus tumor, if it's soft, it's very safe to chase it into the cavernous sinus, lateral to the carotid, um, uh, in any of the cavernous sinus compartments, you can chase it with suction. If it's a firm tumor, you have to be very careful pulling a firm tumor from the cavernous sinus, either for the cranial nerves or the carotid artery. You will see most of the videos you see of cavernous sinus surgery at conferences are soft tumors because those are the ones you can remove and they look nice in a video. I have seen some very skilled surgeons remove firm tumors from the cavernous sinus, but you have to be experienced and you have to be very careful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have one raised hand from Dr. Afsal Sharaf. Dr. Sharaf, you can ask your question, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Raja. Um, so my name is Afsal Sharaf, and uh, I'm a fellow here at Fujita Health University. So coincidentally, uh, I had a cutout course on endoscopic uh, skull-based approaches, and uh, this lecture was uh, really, really reinforcing. Uh, thank you very much for those all uh, all those beautiful uh, videos. Um, and uh, also coincidentally, Professor Watanabe was one of the uh, tutors there. So um, uh, very interesting today the uh, the unfolding of uh, events. Um, anyways, my question is: I know that um, there is a, a lot of variation in the postoperative management of uh, pituitary tumor cases. Um, I did my residency in Germany, so. Um, we keep the patients for at least seven days and uh, we uh, we take uh, samples for electrolytes and also um, uh, define uh, the urine production and so on. So I was wondering how how uh, you in the United States go about uh, postoperative care in, in that regard in your uh, department, uh, Professor Sada. And also, uh, for example, the number of ICU stays, uh, st uh, days and also the rate of infection. Um, these are My the pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Sharaf. Great questions and congratulations on your uh, training. Uh, I can do, I can, I'll try to summarize it very quickly. Um, about half the patients go to ICU, half the patients go to the floor. It depends mm -hmm. on vision involvement and whether there's a CSF leak repair. Uh, and, and if it's a Cushing's patient, those are kind of our criteria. Um, uh, uh, and if they're in the ICU, it's usually for one night, uh, rarely past one night, unless there's a lumbar drain in place for an extended approach, then they will stay in the ICU for about uh, two to three nights uh, for monitoring. 
Uh, we do not give steroids empirically. We do testing before we, we do a steroid sparing protocol during surgery, unless they are on steroids already, or they have, uh, if they have Cushing's, we obviously avoid steroids at all costs. Post-operatively, we check cortisol the uh, post-op day one in the morning. And, uh, and if needed, we recheck it. And that's usually our guide in addition to patient symptoms about whether they, they need uh, uh, any replacement. Uh, most of our patients go home by day two, Some uh, about a third go home post-op day one. Um, after surgery, we always check a post-operative day seven sodium as an outpatient. That has been our screening for many, many years. We're able to pick up symptomatic and asymptomatic hyponatremia and intervene with fluid restriction. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a very close team with endocrine who helps to monitor these patients, obviously for anything like DDAVP or anything else. Uh, so I, I, uh, we also ask them to fluid restrict the first week. What some of my colleagues have done, um, Ed Laws started doing this at the Brigham is to give them a bottle, one liter bottle, uh, um, at the time of surgery and tell them that they can only drink this, you know, drink this bottle uh, during the week. And this is their limit. Uh, and, and so that's a nice way sometimes of, of, of doing that. Um, and there's some new medications actually coming out that could, may help prevent hyponatremia that they're testing in Europe. Um, I, I've heard as well. So, uh, so that's kind of how we do it. We, we, we send patients home early. We monitor them as outpatients. We have a low threshold to bring them back in. Infection rates are really low really, really low. Uh, uh, meningitis, about 1%, usually with a CSF leak, a couple of cases without a CSF leak. We've had meningitis that um, seem to do well, usually. Uh, um, but that's, that's kind of, th those are kind of our patterns uh, right. of how, how we do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, where I did my residency, we used to keep the patients for at least six days and uh, uh, like check sodium every day and check uh, the endocrine, uh, the hormones on the sixth day. And then uh, we decided if we are to like uh, discharge the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Very contrasting. Yeah, that's a great way to do it for close observation. You know, the, the Cushing's patients end up, even though the, the tumors are smaller, they end up staying longer because sometimes it takes 72 hours for the cortisol to, to bottom out. It can take a little bit longer. So they end up actually staying a little longer sometimes. And actually the our DI rates, even though it's temporary DI, are a little bit higher in Cushing's cases sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we're looking in the back of the cella or, you know, sometimes we're a little aggressive with the posterior gland, I think. And, and actually the posterior gland can mimic a tumor sometimes, the color. So uh, uh, we th there are sometimes higher rates of transient DI in our Cushing's cases as well, but we like to watch them sometimes for three days. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. I think it has been a wonderful discussion and uh, we can wind up this session. I will hand this podium to Professor Watanabe for his final remarks. Okay, today we could have a great lecture from Professor Zada about uh, uh, many things, many uh, wise uh, ideas and uh, techniques, uh, and uh, we learned a lot. So thank you, Professor Zada. And someday you, maybe we well. will meet you again somewhere yes. in the near future. I okay. would like that too. Thank you, Professor Radnavi. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful session, and we learned a lot. I believe both uh, Professor Watanabe and Professor Zada would be engaged today. It's a Saturday. So thank you very much. Uh, you are free to leave at your will. Uh, and I will move on to the second session. And I would like to invite Professor Ken Matsushima to say a short introduction. I would invite Professor Kellis for his lecture. Dr. Ken, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Um, I am Ken Matsushima from Tokyo Medical University. And I am very appreciated for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. In this second session, we have Professor Abdullah Kellas from the University of Wisconsin. He has a great career in the United States and his home country, Turkey, and is now playing an outstanding role as a founder and member of Magison Micro's Neurosurgery Initiative. 
I also studied microneurosurgical anatomy in the United States under Professor Rotten with some Turkish friends. And what, what I learned in the lab is essential for my current clinical activity. So I am very, very excited to learn a lot from his experience and also his global wide perspective in Professor Baskaya's lab, which is one, one of the most famous and active neuroanatomical labs right now. So Professor, could you please start your lecture? Sure. Hi everyone. First of all, thank you so much for having me today. It's a great honor for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, for the introduction. Okay, so today I, I will talk about a little bit it, our previous experience, like like two years experience about like uh, microsurgery training in global neurosurgery, and I will share my my experience in Dr. Bashkia's lab. So first of all, I have no conflict of interest in our law system medicine. Everyone is welcome here. It's very beautiful summers. So I will I will very briefly mention about my background because like like it might be give the ideas for the audience. So uh, during my medical uh, school years in Turkey, I visited a couple times in United States and worked in a couple different laboratories. In 2012 and 2013, I, I was working in Dr. Bashka's lab, lab. And then I returned back to Turkey and graduated from my med school in 2015 and did two years uh, obligatory work for the government and spent two and a half years in Yetepe University, uh, which uh, Dr. Ultra is chairman. And I returned back to the United States in 2019. This is very brief to my background. And uh, since June 2021, I, I, I became Dr. Bashkaz lab manager. This is our beautiful uh, state of art uh, nursery laboratory. And uh, Dr. Bashka is the director for that space, and I'm doing his lab manager. And very briefly, my personal experience in laboratory training. When I was here in 2013, I started working with the microscopes and did like some arachnoid and vessel uh, dissections under another microscope. And that time I, I, I remember that I decided to do continue neurosurgery for my future career. And whenever I returned back to Turkey, graduate, and I spent two and a half years in Dr. Trey's clinic, and I did like OR observership. I worked in his ward and also did one year research fellowship uh, in his clinic and complete courses that are one of the oldest microneurosmosis course uh, that Yashagi started in Zurich and then return back to medicine and continue my work here in Dr. Bashkar's laboratory. So today I will briefly mention about history of microvascular surgery, our bypass training curriculum and our initiative. I think the, the history part is one of the most important part to understand what we are doing today and what we are, why we are doing uh, those kind of things. So let me start with that part. I'm going to mention about two cases, and I think those are really important cases that change the whole field. First case, Sadi Carnot, he was pres president of France and uh, assassinated in Lyon in 1887 uh, with a knife in the abdomen. And unfortunately, the surgeons couldn't save uh, him because of they were not able to suture uh, vessels that time. And one medical students from Lyon, Alexis Karel, he, he thinks about that problem and criticized like the, the, the current like uh, their superior surgeons why we are not able to do the anosomosis like the sutured vessels. Then during his medical year he published one paper uh, triangulation techniques and that that uh, showed very briefly showed the techniques and he showed that we can we can uh, repair microscopically the vessels. Then, then he moved to United States and continued his work in United States and get the, like the first Nobel Prize, uh, bring the uh, first Nobel Prize to United States in medicine in 1912. And this shows that like uh, caricature shows like his his uh, work what he did in United States different kind of like. Uh, transplantation. He's a very important person. There was one problem 
They were not able to suture vessels microscopically. Alexis Carrel found a solution and get Nobel Prize in medicine. So that was one case. And after that part, like I, I, I would like to briefly mention about the microsurgery part. So when like the first people that start to use microscope in the surgery was Nylon ENT surgeon, most of them. And he just used one of the, like the monocular uh, basic microscope for surgeries. His surgeries than Holmgren and Wolstein, very important person, mostly used the uh, microscope in ENT surgeries. Dr. House, uh, Howard House from the uh, University of uh, California, he, he moved to United, uh, Europe and observed Dr. Wolstein so that he is using a microscope in surgery and that. He purchased one, bring to United States, and and then invite Wolfstein to give like courses, teach how to operate with the microscope. Then in the same clinic, Dr. Kersey, as a neurosurgeon, he start to use microscope first time in neurosurgical uh, operations. Then the others came like Jacobson Suarez and Donaghy and all other uh, pioneers did uh, start working in microsurgery. So. And this is the second case I would like to mention briefly that changed the whole field, I think. So Akisenin, cardiac surgeon from Zurich, and he operated on a 17-year-old girl and opened cardiac surgery. After the surgery, patient had right side in hemisyndrome, and then he took the patient to the Professor Yashagil, which performing the DSA at that time, and they saw that central sulcus artery was uh, thrombos. And Akisenin asked him to, okay, go ahead, do the craniotomy, open the vessel, remove the thrombus, and suture it back. And but unfortunately, that time it was not possible. And Yeshaya said that this, there is no such technique. And he he encouraged him to okay, if there is none, please go ahead and try. Did you try? And then then they start looking for a laboratory for microvascular uh, training uh, techniques, and ended up with Donaghy's lab and Professor Yeshaya. He spent like uh, 14 months in Donaghy's lab, Burlington, Vermont, and mainly he performed vascular anastomosis duplications, loops, and vein grafts, arterial grafts, synthetic grafts, and patch. The, his main work was vascular, microvascular uh, surgeries uh, on like animals and also training. Then he returned back in 67 and did the first successful SDMCA uh, bypass case. And I would like to emphasize the importance of the, the date. So, Professor Shaggy was born in 25. When he moved to the United States for a uh, laboratory train in microvascular surgery, he was already 40 years old. And I think this is really important. So, there is no time like uh, for, for uh, such training. So do we still need microvascular surgical training? So this is a, uh, from the conference that they organized with Donaghy and Yeshagil organized in Burlington, Vermont after his time in uh, Vermont. And uh, in that book, even that time in 66, they were like different techniques, like suturing techniques, adhesive substance, microstopper, electrocoptation, and lasers, even in the 60s and so far, the, the most widely used techniques are still the suturing techniques that show that it's quality uh, against all other techniques. So where we are using today, so this is from Dr. Varsky's slides. Uh, we are using those microanostomosis techniques for flow augmentation, replacement, or prophylactic protective surgeries. But from the previous example, Yashagil did microvascular surgeries in Donaghy's lab, and when he returned back to Zurich, he started doing vascular cases like the bypass cases, but on the other side, he transferred those skills to a whole field of the neurosurgery and make it like micro neurosurgery. He did the tumor like the AVM mannerism with the same micro, uh, micro techniques. So that's surely important. It's not all about just like bypass cases or vascular cases, it's all about the micro neurosurgery uh, training. So I would like to show one one paper that we, we published uh, where we can use such techniques. So this is uh, from Dr. Tres' uh, practice. So arachnoid suturing. We had a one patient with a ponypal Lindau syndrome and uh, posterior fossa angioblastomas. So 
I will quickly show it. Here you can see the hemangioblastoma. Here. Then here you open the stenomac it really sharp and straight and preserve it. And he planned to close it after the, after the surgery with tenon sutures. Because he said, like, this is like the syndromic patient, and he might like have another surgery in the same area that for I should, I should close it and make it easier for second uh, surgery. So he, he detached the arachnoid and keep on the side during the surgery. Then he removed the hemangioblastoma. Then, then suture. The arachnoid, stenomac arachnoid with tenor sutures. So those kind of techniques that we still need, and that's that's really also good techniques to practice during the surgery with micro suturing techniques, continuous suturing, and this is after closure. So it shows the importance of arachnoid closure. Uh, after like seven years, the patient had another lesion very close to that area and. Pay attention to the like the adhesion. So before that time, this is the second opening, but arachnoid layer is fully intact, almost fully intact, is the whole, but there is no adhesion. So, so such techniques make it much easier for, for the second surgeries, and then we had another lesion and he removed it safely and closed it. And also he used thin gelatin sponge for uh, dural adhesions to prevent dural adhesions. And this is another case that we published, uh, this is Dr. Bashke's case. Why do we still need such such training, microvascular training, laboratory training? So, oops, sorry. Yeah, here. So these are like the aneurysm cases, and there was a vascular derail injury. It might happen very rarely, but whenever it happens, you should be able to like re recover and uh, repair the, the injury. So he's, he's trying to see the PICA aneurysm, choroidal aneurysm, anterior and PICA aneurysm. And he, he planned to do intradural uh, anterior cline. We mostly prefer to do extracranial, uh, extradural anterior clinectomy. And he didn't uh, ask for a specific uh, drill. He said, like, I will just do a very, very uh, small one. And just suddenly he catched the, like the, the, the MCA branches and he stopped it. And uh, suddenly then, then reversed the drill and to get rid of from the vessels then it starts but already he, he exposed the ICA he had proximal control and he just went down to ICA and put the temporary clip and stopped the bleeding and then find the, the, the injury part then put two sutures and save the rest of the MCA so I will quickly move that part here very small tear. He's just putting two teeth there and saving the rest of the artery. And patient didn't have major uh, complication out of that incident. So that also shows the another part of uh, where we can use those techniques. But as I said before, from the history, we know that this is like any kind of micro surgery laboratory training. It's not just about like the microvascular uh, surgery. It's all about micro surgery. And Yeshua in multiple places in like papers and books, he, he offered at least like one year laboratory training for every neurosurgeon. That's also another reason that we should we should uh, do such such training. For, for microvascular training, we have the course, and whenever uh, I was in Yeritepe, we had like Istanbul Yeshagi microsurgery courses, which a uh, modern freak, a uh, Rosemary freak, perform microostomosis course, teach microostomosis course, and this year we, we, we're going to have it uh, very soon. And in, in here, UW Medicine, we have also very similar microostomosis courses, Dr. Bashkes annual courses. Other than those courses, we have a bypass training curriculum. Here's Dr. Bashkes bypass training curriculum. I would like to briefly mention about it and cause like he, I will show that other examples. So here, Dr. Bashke, when he came to UW Medicine in 2006, he initiated this uh, curriculum. And like at that time, his uh, residents 
uh, start to work on site site training. We had like multiple sessions, four sessions. We start with continuous panel draining, uh, continuous suturing, six or seven or sutures, five at a time each. After the first section, and we move to second section, perform anastomosis type in nine or sutures and two and three millimeter silicone tubes. Then, like we have 12 uh, attempts on section two, we move on to section three. We have nine attempts, three uh, anosomosis type, three uh, attempts per each. Then, at the end, section four, we perform rat surgery with the uh, fellows, uh, at least one uh, successful end to end or end to end anosomosis. This is the curriculum that each of our research fellows uh, perform whenever they arrive. It takes around like two weeks. I came up with a day by day schedule. So in the first four days, we just read from like the Ashagi's old book to understand like the historical background and also read from our clients like very famous microsurgeon, microsurgeon and very famous book. And also watch from like different surgeons, like Atlant's videos. You can find also on YouTube from Dr. Bashkia's current practice. And after, on day four, they, they start to watch my training videos. Like for first three section, I have like almost like 10 hours, like training videos. They, according to their section, they review those, watch those uh, videos and they start their practice on day fifth. So uh, this is from 2017 WFNS meeting in Istanbul. So Max Broda, he said like the learning experience will be incomplete without self investigation. Whatever we do, we should we should go back and investigate uh, ourselves. Therefore, like for such training, if I do any kind of like laboratory training, microvascular anosomosis training, we we thought that we should come up with a like the, the uh, assessment by ourselves. Therefore, we came up with a new assessment tool that we're gonna publish soon. Medicine object self assessment tool, even a metrical. They can watch my training videos and do their practice with silicone to panrose drain or chicken vessels, and they can assess their own results by our own uh, way, uh, according to our medicine objective tool. So this, those kind of practice, it's not new. Uh, since like 1960s, 70s, those are the basics all the pioneers like uh, achieved and did a really good job. So since like uh, it's not new and there's no big difference that what we are doing, we just came up really objective that we, we can count, we can measure, uh, the, the assessment uh, and then everybody can use it and very briefly I will mention about like the initiative that we did uh, using our Bashka's uh, curriculum also uh, learn the, the things that we learned from the past so when I was in Yeditepe University during my research fellow time Professor Echagi one day he bring me that uh, book Craig, Evangel Craig, a really good neurontomist and an illustrator. He drew all those uh, illustrations by himself, also published his, like, printed his books by himself. And he said, like, I remember that Yashagi told me that he purchased that book from an old bookstore for very cheap, like a couple of dollars, he said. And that's, I kept that in mind that because in my country, we don't recycle everything, like, even including the books. But here in the United States, they, they recycle everything. They don't trash out anything. So that that was I, I kept in my mind. And this is like the, the current uh, microscope that Professor Ture is using. And I learned a lot uh, about microscopes from Ture and from Yashagi, Dr. Ture and uh, Professor Yashagi. And I know like what we need from the microscopes and all uh, I read a lot about the history of microscope uh, technology, but this is like the very, very good microscope, which has like 4K 3D recording, mouthpiece and very light and distance from eyepiece to like the objective lens is very close. It's it's perfect microscope for micro surgery. So when I came to here, UW Medicine, we were like uh, working on Dr. Bashir's curriculum with a new microscope and 
We had another microscope, stereo microscope, tabletop microscope sitting on the corner of our laboratory. And it was even like uh, dusty and dirty. One day I said, I saw that it's, it's Zeiss made. And, and I said, that, that should be a really good one since I know a little bit about the microscopes. Then I disassemble it, clean it and put it back all together. And I just test it in the like room light without any external light. And I say like, this is perfect. We should we should get some of those microscopes, find those microscopes and use this for microvascular practice. Then I look for like the options and find like sources that I can purchase such microscopes, stereoscopic uh, stereo microscope, that table type stereo microscope. And those are the first microscope that I purchase. And you can see the like the prices. And but that it take me like one year to like do my my uh, search. What where can I find those microscopes? How can I purchase those microscopes? And those are from like the mostly online auction uh, uh, web page. And it was like during the COVID time, it was a little bit hard. Then I, whenever I got new microscope, I tried those microscopes with different like light source, different instruments, and applied to our curriculum. I said, then I realized that those are really high quality microscopes and you can use those kind of microscopes for microsurgical practice. And after me, like lots of other people used, and this is Thomas, that time he was undergrad student and he did one of the best like example that I can solve. So this is like the 6-0 first attempt, continuous switching six centimeters. And this is the last uh, fifth attempt. So even first attempt and fifth attempt, there is big difference. And that shows that like even the undergrad students with the dedication, they can achieve really good practice. And after me and like other people used, we had like neurosurgery exposure course for uh, medical students. And they also used the Microsoft that I purchased online and they were, they were able to use it comfortably. And after med students, we, we had like, like since last two years, we had like 50 international research fellow observed from 27 countries. They also use it, and that shows that the, the quality of the microscope and their application, uh, their usability for for such purposes. Then I got more and more microscope uh, from online sources mostly. Then those are like since the online purchases mainly did not check before. I, I didn't have any chance to check their quality before, but very very late. Maybe just a couple of them had like some problem that I I came up with the solution and repaired them. But mostly they are fine. And because of that, my background with the, like the the history of like the microscope technology, I I I know that like we could use such microscope tabletop microscope for real surgery because those provides everything that we need from a microscope, like like magnification, stereoscopic vision. And right now we have much better like external light source options, which I, which I, I tried a lot and choose the best one. So this is the same microscope that I, I have. It's the tabletop microscope, just the ocular part and the power port part. They just put on a different stand and use for surgery. This is from a real surgery and this is from, uh, as far as I know, Burlington, Vermont. Dr. Jacobson, a vascular surgeon, pioneer of vascular surgeon, and he was also using the same microscope that we had in our lab, the tabletop microscope, just attached to a different stand. That's the only difference. So that shows the quality of such microscopes. Even people were using those microscopes in the real surgeries. Then I got more and more, and then one day we had one uh, neurosurgery resident law from Lebanon, Sharbal, and he came from Lebanon for a very short time, one month research fellowship in our lab. And one day he said to me, like, I pay like thousand dollars just for a ticket, and and he was his like monthly salary was two hundred dollars. I said like that's 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 okay but but it's not easy to ask some people to like like pay like five months salary to come to united states and did uh, do such such training in our place i said like you should be able to do such training in your home countries and and that's that's the way to how to do it that i donate like one of my microscope with the, like instruments and suture materials everything that he needs to 
like uh, teach such such practice uh, curriculum practice in his place then he took them to the Lebanon and like then he gave me two residents to train and we did like online sessions I I did live demonstration for them and they they work on practice then after some time very recently I saw on social media even like plastic surgeons they were using the same microscope that we sent uh, that place so that's also a really good example that uh, who can use and they like, also show the quality of those uh, matches that we sent there and then we get involved to a dream of like Dr. Kuzi, Paraguay Neurosurgery Society uh, president. He he was planning to have a microsurgery lab set up in, in uh, their home countries. And somehow we, we get involved thanks to the, our chairman, Dr. Dempsey. He, he introduced me to the group that were planning to set up that laboratory. I gave like my expertise through the microscope instruments for, for that laboratory and also donate those four stereo microscope and one bigger operating microscope to that lab. Then we did some online uh, sessions, training sessions and lectures. Then they did, they did uh, training after our online sessions with the microscope that we sent them. And this is Dr. Kuzli. That was his uh, dream to set up such a laboratory in Paraguay. Then uh, very recently, in G beginning of the June, I was uh, in Paraguay uh, and we did two days hands-on course. And Dr. Nira Pata from Birgen Wilmas, he was also present then and he, he joined the first day of the course, present case and show his techniques. And then I, I donated a couple other microscopes to Turkey, different places and train other people, uh, neurosurgery residents. This is Sefa, he, he trained with microscope that I sent there and we had another people. Then I, I start to give microscope to our research fellows and observers coming from abroad and who don't have such, such a opportunity in their countries. This is Dr. Bari from Bangladesh. And we did another online session with Bangladesh Neurosurgery Society. And after our session, they did some training in their lab uh, and I also donate one microscope to our previous lab manager, Burak uh, Ozai, and he is right now in neurosurgery resident in Oklahoma. And we right now, like we, we put a beam speaker and camera on it, and we made like two centers for live demonstration, one in medicine, uh, our place, and second in Oklahoma with that microscope. This is Adafisayo from Nigeria, another microscope, Egypt, and a couple microscope, Malaysia Ideal. I have I gave him one another microscope, uh, Dr. Sabri from Turkey, a couple more microscope. And in, in Turkey, in Dr. Sabri's place, he was a chair in uh, his institution. We set up a real like microsurgery, microneurosurgery laboratory there with the microscope instruments and all other stuff. Even like you can use such microscopes for Cadaver dissection is good for such uh, such department with uh, like 10 up to 10, 12 uh, residents. And I donate like micro instrument sets, micro instrument sets, all other uh, materials for other places, as you can see here. I send like Kenya, Philippines, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and a couple other places in Turkey and Egypt, Chad. So I donate as much as I, I could find. Uh, so those are some of the ones that we donate other places. So far, we, we donate as a medicine magnetic initiative, 60 of those stereo microscopes in 30 centers in 19 low and middle income countries. And I will show that couple cases that as a like outcome that what we did. So this is one, the first case. Sorry, I have to. Sorry. So those are the centers that we, we established, like such training. And one day, like we, our research fellow from India, Dr. Jayun, he spent one month in our laboratory and complete our curriculum here and returned back to his country. And one day he sent me that text and he said, like, Thanks to you and Dr. Like, Bashke that your curriculum gave me so much confidence and I could do like bypass. And that was his first bypass successful MCA, uh, STA, MCA uh, bypass cases. So 
such practice enables him to uh, have enough confidence to do surgeries. We have another examples. Dr. Yani, he was in our lab before me and he, he spent a couple months in our lab and completed the curriculum and went back to his home country, Chad. And in his home country, uh, we were planning to establish a such practice, microsurgery practice, laboratory practice. And we were like sending emails back and forth. And one day he told me that in his country, there is no trained surgeons to perform AV fistula for hematoelitis patients. Since he did such training in our lab, microvascular surgical training, he started to do those cases. Otherwise, patients have to like neighbor uh, countries and get it a few still done and come back uh, to chat to get hemodialysis. So far, he did like like 13 of such cases as a nurse surgeon, but he is doing a few still for them and all dialysis patients. And this is another example. Another example from Turkey, Dr. Sabri, he showed me that picture that when he returned back uh, to Turkey after our, our fellowship, uh, Orthopedic colleagues, they called him to the surgery because like they injured a nerve, but they were not able to do micro suturing to repair that nerve. And as a nurse surgeon, he went to OR and they helped them to do nerve uh, anastomosis for that patient and to save a patient's function. It was another like really good example that shows that like where we can use such micro techniques. And also, as I say, like this is not all about like microvascular training or so microvascular surgeries. That affect all of your like the surgical uh, skills. So this is another example from Spain, Alberto. He spent like four months in our lab and returned back to his home country. And one day he he was operating with like the uh, senior uh, faculty, and he took over. Then then senior faculty, attending faculty, he. Always like he saw that his his practice changed and that shows like such practice the, and how he improves the uh, other other uh, procedures like skills. So very recently, like a couple months ago in January, I was planning to go back to Turkey, my home country, and establish a laboratory in uh, Dr. Sabri's place, and then I. He already got those for microscope, and I, I took those other mic instruments and the microscope to that. And also, I was uh, having a couple other microscopes with me for other places in Turkey, and also those other microscopes for uh, to transfer to Egypt. I took all those microscopes with me, including my uh, like the Zeiss microscope. So, and I was we were organizing to have, we organized a couple uh, courses there. I packed my old microscope to big like, suitcases and took them to every other places, traveled with the bus or I had flights to, to move around. And then we did couple courses. In nine center, I gave lecture and six of those centers, uh, we did one day hands-on course. So this is the place that I graduate from med school. I gave a lecture for the residents. And then in Medellin University, Dr. Sabri's place, we did like the lectures first and then demonstration with the microscope. The my Zeiss microscope had two observers, one binocular, one monocular, two person could watch me and then they moved to their station and I got two more uh, people for demonstration. So we did great. And then in Yeditepe University, the same day, I gave a lectures where Professor Trey Chairman and Yesha is a faculty. So that was like the team. And in Diyarbakir, East Turkey, most rural part of Turkey, we had another course, one day course. First, every time we start with lectures, then, then uh, like demonstrations, I use the same microscopes and Mainly during those courses, we perform like anastomosis type end to end and side and side anastomosis with seven O sutures and, and using a six O suture using Penrose drains. So, in another place, I moved to another place, close city. We did the same course, one day course, lectures, demonstration. And those are like some like local and uh, national news about our course because. Wherever I go, it was mainly like other than Istanbul, mainly was the first micro course in those cities. And 
those cities are like the most rural part of the Turkey and biggest institution and biggest cities in those part of Turkey. Another place, Atatürk University, Erzurum. And this is our group. We did really good. And in that place, my friend, he has like very small lab, but he, he worked very efficiently. They had like two microscopes, old microscope, but they did a really good job there. And then I moved to our neighbor country, uh, Georgia, Tbilisi, and did another course there. Like Ziviat, he was our research fellow uh, from medicine, and he helped me to organize such courses, lectures. And in their place, they had another microscope, which has a, a camera that I was able to do a demonstration for all at the same time. Then we did the hands-on part. Then I moved to Azerbaijan, Baku, and give a lecture in a, their medical university and did another uh, lectures in another institution in the same city, Baku, and then hands-on part. Very recently in June, beginning of the June, as I mentioned before, I, I went to I visited Paraguay and saw the, the microscope and laboratory that we established that and organized two-day course with uh, Dr. Niral Patel from Brigham Women's. And that was my, my same microscope. At that time, I attached a micro uh, camera on the other side of the beam sector, So I was able to do demonstration for and project it on the screen. So after that, like in March, I was in uh, Lidurak, and uh, thanks to Dr. Kirish and Dr. Abu, they gave me like 10 minutes to mention about like my my work, uh, our work in, in Ani. And after the, that uh, talk, one guy came to meet uh, Adrian from Mexico and he said like, we have really good, beautiful laboratory established one month ago. We should, we should do something together. Then, then we plan another course in Mexico and very simply just a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Guadalajara and we did the first micro uh, anastomosis course in good, the place. They had very beautiful lab. And also I took I took a couple of my microscopes there and we had like over 20 people at the same time uh, working for uh, for micro anastomosis practice. So this is my basic uh, uh, course setup. So mostly I had like 10 microscopes, some instruments for microsurgical practice. And that was my microscope that was attached a beam splitter and two observer to one monocular, one binocular. Then I, I can replace, uh, replace the other one with the camera and do the demonstration for the whole you know, screen. Then I, I, I read that uh, chapter from Professor Shagir after I did a couple of those courses. So he mentioned that he did the first micro neurosurgical course in Zurich in 1968. And they were like also having like 10 operating microscopes from Zeiss and also some jewelry instruments because that time they didn't have any specific instruments for design for microsurgery. And up, even they didn't have any laboratory. They did in pathology department. They didn't have specific laboratory that shows that what we need for such courses. And it's really good example that we don't have to have a specific location. Most of the places, we didn't have the lab space. Like we, we didn't have like conference room or, or any other like the med school laboratories. And this is all a whole about like the cost so far. Like this is my card that I saw like last year. The, the money that we spent, it's like with the same money, I could I could get like the four of that card. And that was like my new card that I got with credit loan. If I just try to sell the only the microscope, not including the instruments, I could get that card for free. And those are like the things that I, I spent for, like the, the place, the sources, uh, so mostly like the surplus departments, state or university uh, surplus departments and also like mainly I spend like for the microscopes and hands-on courses like in-person hands-on courses and those are like the, the, my team so far we had like 19 members from 16 countries each of them uh, were our uh, search fellows and my my friends from all over the world and also, like, this is not just, like, uh, the laboratory work. We had lots of, like, con uh, collaborators for the courses, for the 
establishing such practice in in other countries and those are all the peoples that contributed and special thanks to our chairman dr damsey is one of the leader in global neurosurgery and chair for fiance organization one of the biggest organization for a global neurosurgery also my uh, two mentors professor Ture and uh, bashkaya that they really like the encouragement the region i couldn't able to do such things of course professor ashag is i learn a lot during my time in yetip university uh, i learn a lot from him and get inspired just like one things that he 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 told me one day uh, then then i came up so far and i would like to end it up with like that beautiful uh, uh, photograph that i took during like 2019 course in yetip university and unfortunately very sad we, we lost uh, dr hernes demi very big loss but he left really good like a uh, big uh, things behind him that we can follow uh, and i this is like the shag is saying that i really like the better we see the more we know the more we know the better we see i thank you for your attentions i would like to have if you have any question i would like to answer thank you thank you very much for your wonderful lecture in japan um some young neurosurgeon tried to buy the desktop microscope for their practice but still in, even in japan it's very difficult for it's very expensive for young neurosurgeons so i was surprised that you can re use the old operative microscope and rebuild the desktop microscope i was very surprised now let's open for discussion any comments or questions so far there are none in that case we can wind up the session okay thank you okay. thank you very much professor yeah. ken thank and you so much yeah it is our great honor to have you here today so i'll close this officially now on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president of cfo kato i would like to thank both speakers of today professor gabriel zada and dr abdullah khalas as well as the chairs professor tadashi watanabe and dr ken matsushima for the time and support for the acns webinars i would like to express my sincere gratitude to professor shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the wicha channel and today we have around 370 people who have joined us live from across the world also my special thanks to my co-host dr lubun sen for joining me today so until we all meet online tomorrow it is bye bye from all of us thank you very much for joining